In my last episode, we explored the range and registers of the string section, and I gave you a chance to arrange a little melody for strings, and we made this a competition. Let's start with something basic. So we have our melody, and we put some chords under it. My chords here are A minor, then C, F, and then A minor, C again, F, then G, and then ending on A minor. But of course, I'm not just playing in triads underneath, I'm arranging for strings. And so as we've already learned what registers are best and what ranges are comfortable and so on, this one is quite clear. I've given one note to each section with the first violins on the melody and everyone else playing one note per bar. We have everything in the chord in descending order. The second violin on the highest note, violas, then cellos, and then the basses on the bottom. In this short example, as the melody doesn't go into a high register, we're keeping everything below the melody. The second violin is basically staying on the G string the entire time. The viola sticks within a fifth. The cello is in a comfortable and mellow baritone register in its second octave. And the basses are not too low either, between a C and the A above, but not in their lowest octave. All the notes, including the melody, which is contributing to the harmony, are within two and a half octaves basically all of the time. With string writing, you don't need to fill in every note of the chord. That is, you don't need every note of the triad. Things can get a bit thick and messy if we do that, especially in the lower registers, which we'll come back to a bit later. Well, of course our first attempt is pretty simple. It's not bad. I mean, without the melody, these chords are still nice. And each string line by itself has a nice flow, which is the kind of thing you want to be thinking about when you're writing for strings. The underlying principle here is something called voice leading. Voice leading is the way in which individual voices move from chord to chord. So if I spread out my chord to the string section, each instrument group is their own voice. Good voice leading tends to be when all individual voices move smoothly. You could have a voice leading where all voices walk in parallel, which would result in a very blocky structure. However, this can soon start to sound a bit boring. So you could then go for something a bit more creative, where the individual voices move in different directions to each other, or even interplay with one another, and not just your main melody. This second example uses the same melody and the same chords, but with a little bit more creativity in the voicing. In the MIDI here, each colour is showing you a different voice, each one being a different group of instruments. Between the first two chords, the second violins and the violas move down in direction, while the basses and cellos move up. So we go from a wider voicing to a closer voicing, and it's a nice sound. We keep a parallel motion over the next chords, which sounds nice with these moving thirds, and then the last three chords are back to not always moving in the same direction. What we've also got here is something that has a bit more interest than just one chord per bar. As I said, there's nothing wrong with one chord per bar. But if it's starting to feel bland, then we could do something like this, where there's a bit more rhythm on the upbeats of the bars, or a few areas where the other voices have something more interesting to do. How do you go beyond that? from just assigning pitches from your chords to a really original and interesting arrangement. The key here is what we hinted at in the last episode, musical intention. Okay, the intention of this next arrangement is something very sad and melancholy. I started with that one intentionally because to me, that says something about the low registers. And I want something that labors a bit, so I've slowed the tempo down too. Have a listen to what I've done.
I've done two things right off the bat here to help me get the feeling that I want. The first thing is that initially the violin is just joined by the violas and the cellos. No basses until halfway through the third bar and no second violins until halfway through the arrangement. The second thing is to do with the voicing. We still have the same chords, A minor then C major in the second bar, but instead of having the root note of the chord on the bottom, I'm using different inversions. Here I've gone for first inversions with the third on the bottom. Now in the lower register, this is much less stable and deliberately a bit more muddy and heavy. And there's a reason for that, which is to do with the harmonic series. Every musical note that we hear is not only the sound of the single pitch itself, but a mixture of different frequencies, the so-called harmonic series or overtone series. It's a big topic that we could easily do a whole video on, but for now, we're just going to concentrate on a couple of aspects that can directly apply to arranging. Rule number one. Octaves and fifths are the most stable and resolute intervals. And rule number two, close harmony is more muddy in the lower frequency range of human hearing than it is in the higher range. What does this mean? Well, it basically means that chords are more stable and balanced if they have a nice wide interval towards the lower register, especially if those intervals are octaves or fifths. And it's for exactly that reason that I've ignored these rules. In this example, we have intervals of a sixth at the bottom of the chord in their first inversion where the weaker third of the chord is the bass. And this time, instead of each instrument group having just one note each, the cellos are playing more than one note at a time. This is called divisi. Divisi means that we divide a whole group of instruments into two or more voices. So in this example, I would assign one note to one half of the cellos and the second note to the other half. Here, the cello low open C is played with an A above it and then an E above in the violas. Same for the second chord, with a sixth on the bottom. Now this is completely intentional. There's something about this that doesn't feel settled. First inversions have this sort of feeling of restlessness, like they want to go somewhere or move up and resolve a bit of that imbalance. Personally, I think it's the use of this first inversion that helps to make this piece a bit more melancholy and aching especially when we're staying in the lower registers of each instrument. The second violin is ending on their low A, basses all the way down to a low F, and divisi cellos with more pitches on the lower, bigger instruments. Next, let's do the opposite. Instead of keeping everything low and limited in range, why not use a large range on each group of instruments and explore the whole palette of the different registers in the strings? So in this example, the first thing that happens by using a wide range where the violins leap up to play the melody and the bass stays low is that we're immediately feeling lighter, brighter and more airy. Same chords, still in A minor, but somehow it's all a bit more positive as we go through the piece. And it helps that most of our chords are back into the root position in the bass, with octaves or fifths above in the cellos. The lightness and airiness is also there because we have more moving lines. The violas are fairly quick, moving tremolo parts, and the cellos aren't just moving on the downbeats and also go up high into their tenor register too. And I keep this going in the second half of the arrangement as well. The violas stay tremolo, but start filling in the harmony here, while the cellos start to move around a lot more with their own counterline, and the second violins are playing light descending octave runs. In this case, the parts don't have to just be long notes, or just harmony to the melody. We can be a bit more creative with the lines and the way the instruments articulate them. And finally, I really wanted to get outside of the box for this last example, where I wasn't tied to the same harmony or even the same time signature. This one is just a real exploration on the melody.
very different to the other examples, right? So let's break it down a little bit. First off, the two obvious things. I've changed the key, we've gone from A minor to C minor, and I've changed the time signature from 3-4 to 4-4. The key change allows me to have a low C pedal in the basses, their lowest note, which is really brooding. And the meter change means that each phrase in my melody has space for a gap between it, which I'm filling in with chords on Divisi violins, played soltasto and very softly. The next obvious thing. I'm using a solo violin and then a solo cello to deliver the melody, and they have a sort of call and response between the first two phrases. It's nice to play the melody in a different register for once. And the rest of the arrangement stays very sparse until the final part with just harmonics in the other violins and the viola sections. Well, I hope I could give you some insights and ideas on how to go about arranging for strings. And as promised, it's now time to reveal the winner of our first virtual orchestration competition. And let me just say thank you to each and every one of you for contributing to it. We received some great string arrangements and it was genuinely hard for us to pick a winner. But we did have to pick one out of nearly 150 entries. And so the winner of our very first virtual orchestration competition and winner of a copy of the Berlin Orchestra created with Berkeley Library is Andrea Amici. Have a listen to some of the arrangement here, but please do go check out the full track as well, which is linked in the description. But I said it was genuinely hard to pick a winner, and I wasn't lying. We had so many great entries that we felt we needed to reward your efforts a little more and give away more than one prize. And there were two arrangements that came in at a very close second. The first was this arrangement by Florian Voss. and the other was by Calden Alexander. These two will get a copy of the Tallinn Library by Orchestral Tools, some chamber strings as a takeaway from our string arranging competition. Thank you again for all of your entries, your wonderful arrangements, and congratulations to our three winners. If you still want to dig deeper into string arrangement, then you might want to check out next week's episode. The head of Berkeley's screen scoring department, Sean McMahon, is talking about advanced string arranging and the so-called Z-clef, which is a mind-blowing concept. Until then, you might just drop us a comment and tell us about your experience with string writing and arrangement, and any challenges and breakthroughs that you've had.